Hey everybody, it's me Pete, pastor here at Crosswalk. Sorry I couldn't be with you today. A friend of mine was in a jam uh, who's a pastor up in Santa Rosa and he asked me to help him out a little bit. Uh, so I said yes and uh, that meant that you get me on video uh, today. I'm really excited about uh, today's uh, session in the series, uh, Animate Practices. I hope you're doing the prayer last week, uh, some of the tools that we picked up from last week's teaching, and I think there's going to be some cool stuff for you here today, and a very interesting challenge uh, later on, and a practice we're going to do together, uh, but I'll get to that in a minute. Today's thing is on food, and we don't really think about food as a spiritual practice, but I think by the end of today, you're going to rethink that. Uh, actually, it is a very deep spiritual practice that we might want to think about. Uh, you know, my relationship with food, I've shared a little bit on and off over the years, uh, but I have a love-hate relationship with food and everything in between, uh, for that matter. Uh, I grew up in a very Christian family, went to church every week. Uh, no alcohol in our house was ever allowed. Uh, it's just the way it was. The fact that I'm a pastor in Napa Valley is a uh, you know, source of uh, great fun uh, now in my family because they've loosened up on some things. Uh, but uh, food definitely was our thing. We weren't alcoholics, but we may have been foodaholics. Uh, so food, um, you know, we were solidly middle class, and we didn't have a lot of extra food around. Uh, sort of the joke uh, growing up in the growing up years when things were a little lean is my mom uh, with four kids and a husband uh, on Saturdays, this was her famous thing, she would from one small can of tuna fish uh, mixed with probably a whole jar of uh, mayonnaise, uh, she would feed us all tuna fish sandwiches. That was our Saturday staple. <laughs> and so for what, about a buck? <laughs> she fed a family of six on that. So uh, there was never any junk food in our house. And so anytime it showed up, it meant that there was a celebration or it meant it was a holiday or we had company or something like that. And I usually lost control. So food for us was kind of a celebratory thing. And first, the reason for celebration was pretty high. Uh, so at the end of an academic year, if I graduated from second grade on to third grade, we'd celebrate. And that celebration would always mean ice cream. That was our celebration food. Uh, you know, the cause for celebration sort of diminished over time. By the time I was in high school, um, you know, earlier years in high school, dad was doing a little bit better financially, so it was the semester report card. And if I did good enough on my semester report card, uh, then hey, time to go get some ice cream. And so we'd eat some ice cream. And then the reason for celebration uh, came down a notch or two, and then it was quarterly report cards. And then it even came down off of that. So if I did great on a test, it was like, hooray, let's do that. Or if I got a part in a play, that's hooray, let's go get some ice cream. And then eventually it was, it's Tuesday, hooray, let's go get some ice cream. So, <laughs> so ice cream, celebration, food, those things are all wrapped together. And we felt good when we ate uh, good food, and it was, it was a fun thing. Uh, usually, uh, if we had company in town Sunday after church, uh, we'd almost always uh, go out to eat with them because that was a day to celebrate uh, together and to be family. That's just the way it was. Um, but, you know, food became something uh, other than just a thing of celebration. Or maybe it is related to this, but uh, when I'd go through stressful times, I found that I was eating more. Uh, have you ever done that? Uh, and so if it was stressing out over studying for a test or whatever, uh, then I'd find myself going through the refrigerator and seeing what there was there. Uh, if, uh, if something was going haywire with a job thing or a relationship thing or whatever kind of thing, um, you know, I'd go grab a burger or whatever. And so food became this, this relationship of comfort. Uh, still a really good thing that I would turn to. Kind of a self-medicating thing, really, now that I think about it. Uh, but then I also kind of developed, uh, because of that, I kind of developed a not-so-great relationship with food after a while because sometimes food would turn on me. Uh, sometimes I'd eat something that had something weird with it, food poisoning or whatever, and I wouldn't be too happy with food for a while, and I'd uh, lay off for a little bit. Or uh, the food I would eat, of course, this has nothing to do with my own self-control, but the food itself... Uh, you know, would tempt me and it would lure me in. And sometimes that food would uh, cause me some serious gastrointestinal uh, problems. <laughs> and and uh, I would have to have to rethink my relationship with food for a while. Uh, you know, uh, when I went to college, um, things changed. Uh, the way you eat in college, especially uh, your freshman year if you're away, uh, it's a different animal. 
uh, you you pay one price and you can help yourself to the to the salad bar or the ice cream bar or whatever as much as you want and in fact I did and so uh, you know I'm kind of an overachiever at times and you've heard that saying the freshman 15 not for me I'm not gonna limit it to 15 no no not if we can go for 20 or 25 or even 30 <laughs> by the time I was done with my freshman year I had some work to do let's just put it that way and I uh, had to work hard uh, to, to get that off and part of my part of my working it off meant I was gonna have to say no to my beloved food and that was not so easy to do even to this day I have this tension with food and those of you who know me pretty well hung out with me a little bit uh, you know that that's true it's kind of a kind of a sight to behold when I have zero discipline whatsoever uh, you know to, uh, to lock your house because I can probably eat you out of house and home uh, if you've caught me in one of those moments and uh, seen me around a, a pizza you know you need to get a slice in a hurry because that thing's going to be gone uh, before too long. It's nothing to be proud about, kind of funny, uh, but kind of not so funny uh, at the same time. Uh, so sometimes when I know I need to get healthy and get back in shape, uh, then I get super disciplined and uh, I, I have this weird, you know, up and down uh, kind of a thing that I don't like. So I'm, I'm in process of figuring out uh, my relationship uh, with food and finding the balance and learning to, to do that in a healthy way. Uh, Sarah Miles, who is the featured uh, teacher today in this series, uh, offers some great insights about how our relationship with food is a little different uh, in today's culture than maybe it has been for some time. I think you're going to find her insights really refreshing, and I think you're going to find where she takes it uh, to be really interesting. And I think it's going to help you rethink and reframe some things you think about food as a spiritual discipline. And then I'll get to the challenge in a moment. Sarah Miles is a local. Uh, she is a pastor uh, in a church in San Francisco in the Potrero Hills area. Uh, she, um, uh, she's minister or director of ministry at uh, St. Gregory of Nyssa uh, Episcopal Church, uh, uh, south of uh, the Golden Gate, or south of the Bay Bridge, just a bit. Uh, she's written several excellent books, and I think you're going to find her an excellent uh, presenter today. Interestingly enough, uh, at one time in her life, she was a devout atheist. And what sucked her in, what lured her in uh, to walking with Christ and then serving Christ as a pastor uh, was bread and cup. So she has a little something to say about our relationship with food as a spiritual practice. Let's check it out. So wasn't that an awesome video? I think she's fantastic. Uh, I get to, I'm going to get to meet her uh, in a little over a month. I'm really looking forward to picking her brain and hearing more about her story. Uh, so we're going to shift things a little bit now, and we're going to put into practice something she alluded to at the end of her video. Uh, your challenge this week is to invite somebody you don't know well at all uh, over for a meal or to a restaurant for a meal. Uh, but over to your house is probably, probably a better way to go. The idea here is, is to practice what Jesus did and what he taught. That food is not just something for our belly, something that we eat, uh, but food is a catalyst for community, for creating community. And so I want you to think about, you know, maybe it's a neighbor, maybe it's a coworker, maybe it's somebody you see regularly at the gym. Could be somebody at church you don't know too well, but would like to get to know better. And the whole point is to bring them over uh, to have a meal together. You know, the houses I grew up in, uh, and again, my family was pretty middle class, but the way houses were designed, at least the ones we lived in, uh, is that you had a kitchen and you had, in our houses, you had an eat-in kitchen, so there was a, a kitchen table, and then you'd also have a separate, uh, fo more formal uh, uh, dining area. Sometimes it was a separate room altogether, but mostly it was a dining area that sort of flowed into a living room which was also a little bit more on the formal side and then uh, you had a family room maybe somewhere else where the family kind of hung out the idea was is that for more formal occasions when you'd have a company over whatever uh, you'd be in the living room which was you know nicer stuff and you'd have dinner with them uh, at the at the dining table in the dining room that was a thing uh, but you know what um, we hardly ever uh, ate at that dining room table. 
I mean, like almost never. Uh, we ate Thanksgiving dinner there uh, because we couldn't all fit in the kitchen. Um, maybe Christmas dinner uh, too, if we had special guests in town, maybe we would do it there, or hospitality, uh, that kind of a thing. But most of the time, uh, you already know where I'm going with, you, you know where we had our meal most of the time, it was in the kitchen. Uh, Lynn and I, um, you know, we watch uh, a good bit of HGTV. All has to do with, you know, homes and decorating and that kind of thing. Lynn's got kind of a penchant for that. And um, anyway, uh, it's interesting because when they go in to redo a house, uh, you know where most of the money goes? It's into the kitchen, the kitchen remodel. Get rid of the ugly tile, get rid of the ugly cabinets, and, and make it nice. And you know why that's probably a good idea? It's not just for resale. It's because that's where most of the life's going to happen uh, in the family, isn't it? Have you ever noticed uh, when you have a family um, get together at your house, you could have really comfortable seating all over the place. You could have a living room, a family room with nice couches. But where does the conversation usually happen? It happens in the kitchen happens around the kitchen table. Uh, I find that fascinating. I'm sitting here in my, uh, my office. Um, after the earthquake uh, that wrecked a lot of my furniture, uh, most of it was my personal furniture, uh, so when uh, the check came in uh, to cover the personal loss, uh, it was kind of my cash to decide, well, what am I going uh, to do to redo my office? And so I decided when I redid my office, I didn't want to make it like a normal office with a regular desk and all that, because most of my work doesn't really require that. I need a working surface, but the desk sometimes doesn't help me a lot. Um, a lot of times when people would come in to talk to me with a the desk, they felt like they were in a principal's office. And so when I went to create this space and recreate it uh, with my wife's decorative touch, the one thing that I knew I really wanted uh, instead of a desk was a large table. Uh, because the dynamic changes uh, in this room uh, when I'm sitting around with somebody uh, with a table instead of across from a desk. And I get the idea from a kitchen table. That's where the real action happens. And it has been surprising that when I've had people in here to talk, there's just a different level of calm <laughs> uh, that's going on in here uh, because I'm sitting here instead of across a desk. And so, um, and so we want you to kind of experience that a little bit uh, today. Uh, partly to practice uh, what we hope you'll do with uh, this week's challenge and inviting a stranger over. Uh, but we're actually going to do communion together uh, in groups. And we're going to experience communion uh, together in a different way than normal. Now, oftentimes I know there's a fancy prayer we pray uh, to recognize that the bread symbolizes uh, the broken body of Christ and the cup represents the shed blood of Christ. And I get that, and that's certainly a movement within it. But, but don't miss the point that simply eating the bread and taking the cup together um, is itself a coming together in Christ. Sarah, Sarah Miles talked about as eating Christ and eating with Christ. It's really profound. And so we're not going to do any formality that way in terms of me saying, okay, now take this bread and all that. Instead, we're going to practice community today. So uh, what's going to happen is somebody, you're going to get into groups, and if you're in the uh, 10 o'clock service, you're already in a group. You're at a table. And if you're alone at a table, I want you to look around and figure out uh, where there's a table that has an open spot and go to that table uh, when the time's right. Uh, if you're in the 9 o'clock service, there's no tables uh, set up. You're, you're, already, you're in your rows like you're used to. But I want you to get into groups of maybe three to seven or eight people. And it'll be a little clunky and it'll work out. Don't worry about it. Uh, and then once you're in that group, what I, what I need you to do is I need you to send somebody from your group or from your table and get the communion elements that you need. And they're already prepared for you uh, toward the front end of, uh, of where we're meeting today. So 9 o'clock is going to be toward the front of the room. And then the 10 o'clock, it's going to be, you know, right at the front of the stage on our, our classic communion table. So somebody from the group, go grab one of the thing, uh, uh, plates of elements and uh, bring them back to your group. And as soon as you're back there, uh, everybody in the group has an assignment. Uh, in your bulletin today, there's an insert. And on that insert, you have some general questions that uh, fit today's teaching, stuff for you to think about through the week to grow in your understanding of food as a spiritual discipline. But on the back side of that, uh, on the bottom half, there are these discussion starters. And here's my challenge for you. Everybody in the group, 
you got to pick one of those discussion starters and respond to it with your group. And everybody's going to take a turn. And as you take communion casually, and I don't care when you take it, if you want to take it all at once, that's fine. If you want to do it one at a time, that's fine. If you want to steal somebody else's bread, <laughs> that's fine. I don't care. Uh, because the point is that you're, you're communing together around these elements and you're talking about stuff uh, that's not just the weather. And so pick one of the questions that you want to answer and take turns uh, answering a question as you take communion. I'm going to give you about 10 minutes. I'm going to give you some cover music uh, while this is happening. And if you run out of time, uh, at, you know, and there's still, uh, if you run out of time, don't worry, uh, after the last song, um, you know, we're going to take an offering and all that stuff, uh, like we usually do with the closing song. Uh, right after the song's over, just pick up where you left off and make sure everybody gets a chance to talk. And if you guys are speed demons and uh, you get through everything and you've got like five minutes left, um, I, I would not ever want you to pick another question and try to build community. No, that would, that would be too obvious. What I want you to do in that remaining few minutes is I want you to stare blankly at each other to increase the discomfort in the room. Could you do that for me? <laughs> you know what I'm saying. Make this thing work, okay? And uh, see what kind of uh, new community you can create because you've taken this uh, challenge seriously, okay? So I'm going to give you a, a 10 minute video or so after that video is done uh, with its background music. I'm going to come and give you a benediction and then uh, the band will come up and lead you in one final song. Got it? All right. Go to it. You know what to do, right? Group, send somebody from the group to get the community elements. Come back, do the questions. I'll see you in 10 minutes. All right, so I hope you had a great experience getting to know each other a little bit better over communion, and I hope communion really happened. I hope that uh, you commune together like you're supposed to. I hope that community uh, was created, and I hope that in some strange way the love of Christ showed up uh, in that moment, because it does, and Christ does, and that's kind of the point of it. And furthermore, I hope that uh, as you re-enter the world this week, uh, I hope that you'll take this experience with you, and I hope you won't leave it here but I hope you'll recreate it with somebody you don't know yet uh, so that uh, this love thing of Christ uh, can, can increase and community can happen in ways that maybe it won't otherwise. You know, we live in a very um, connected world in some respects. We have people with hundreds of Facebook friends and yet loneliness is still something that uh, we all struggle with from time to time. Well, you can do something about that and it has something to do with the sharing table together uh, that you got to experience today. So as you leave today, uh, may you realize that you are not alone, but you have community, and we've seen that here today. And as you go out from this place, may you realize that you have something that the world is desperate for. You have the means of creating community, and I hope you'll have the courage to do that. Thanks a lot for coming today. Thanks for playing along. We hope you had a great experience. I will be here next week, live and in the flesh, uh, to celebrate with you. Come see me on, uh, uh, on Wednesday morning at 11 o'clock or Thursday night at 7 o'clock for the group that I lead. Come Tuesday night for Ann Wagoner's uh, class uh, that she's teaching on the same stuff to follow up with it. It's going great and I hope we see you then. All right, thanks for coming. We'll see you next week.